Right, it's that that most fabulous of times where we get to poke you in the brain, Dave. Sounds uh, intrusive. <laughs> we we, we endeavour to be so at all times. Actually, that's that's it's it's written above my computer. Being be yeah, intrusive. No amount of warnings are going to stop us, police, if that is your real name. <laughs> so, Dave, what is the first book you remember reading and enjoying? Um. I had to think about this because I've obviously heard you interview other people and I was like, well, what would be my answer to this question? And I think I think the first book that was both read to me that wasn't um, like a picture book uh, was, was The Hobbit. And that was probably the first book that I actually sat down and read myself as well uh, a year mm-hmm. or so later. Um, but I remember it's, it's the, you know, I think the troll scene in The Hobbit is the first fictional scene that I can remember first hearing and then reading and kind of visualizing that's the first time I've visualized a piece of uh, a piece of um, fiction in my head uh, and yeah I think and then I read it a few years later and was like oh this is I, th- I think my mum when she was reading it to me might have been skimming some parts I don't know I, I'm pretty yeah. sure we we asked her to stop for a while when we got to the spiders and Markwood because it was just it was a bit much because we were like yeah. seven or eight or something um but yeah, I think The Hobbit is, is probably, which is a very basic answer to give. Uh, I think that's uh, true for many, well, many people. I wouldn't worry about that too much because also in, included there was this idea of uh, you taking part of communal storytelling. I yeah. know it's, it's you know parental and everything, but that sounds like you were being read to with a sibling. Yes, my I, t- I have a twin brother, so we used to you know top bunk, bottom bunk, and uh, mum was reading the the Hobbit to us. That was that was the first very long story that we were read um, because we were getting bored of the story, the the books you could read in one sitting. Did you find? I know it's a long, it's probably a long time ago, and you were kids and all the rest of it. But did you find that you would discuss the the Hobbit with your brother after you you know like the next day you'd sort of be talking about it? Oh yeah, I, I, my my brother uh, was much more of a Tolkien head as a child than I was. He he read the Lord of the Rings before he turned ten, I think. Um, I didn't get yeah. to them until my until my teens. Um, but yeah, we were you know I think we both got into the into fantasy and we both started reading science fiction around that time as well. And it was largely because of that that sort of initial spark of, which again it's like you know it's it's a sort of foundation on foundation stone of uh, English language fantasy fiction. Um, a, but it, it's foundational for a reason, I think, because it's kind of stuck around for so long. Yes, I think. I mean, as, as a, you're probably aware if you've listened to episodes before, but I, I, I do have. I'm, I'm currently surrounded by Tolkien maps. Um, so, to say it's foundational uh, is rings very true for me, and I think yeah. it definitely does for Nico as well. Definitely it does. It's a. Uh... It's, I, I would say it's surprising how often it comes up, but I think we've come out the other side now to where when someone doesn't say, I, you know, Tolkien had a big influence on me as a kid, we go, oh, why not? Why have you not? <laughs> yeah, we have, we have had a few people take some, take some strong anti-Tolkien stances. Um, but I, I would say most people mention Lord of the Rings or The Hobbit when we, when we start talking about early books and... Yeah, that I, led them down the path and stuff. I would definitely say it was it was an early book for I I haven't reread any Tolkien since uh, my mid teens I, d- I don't think um, because I, I kind of moved on relatively quickly and and the one thing I never did as well was to read the sort of the quote unquote golden age science fiction from the fifties and sixties and some of the seventies. I've read mm-hmm. one or two. I've read Dune and things like that, but I, I went I went straight into the eighties and nineties stuff into the William Gibsons and Bruce Sterling's and uh, and um, bit of bit of Ursula Le Guin, bit of that. But I think you know I have dabbled in looking back at at the golden age stuff, and a lot of the time I have gone, oh well, this was kind of a lot of this was done better later. So why yeah. would I go back to the the kind of earlier versions when there's better I... versions? I really had that with Asimov. Like, I really wanted to enjoy Isaac Asimov. 
Yeah, I, well, I, I read a lot of his robot short stories and I really, I've got a massive, or I used to have a massive iRobot collection of his short stories and yeah. that was the one sort of golden age thing that I did read. And I was, made, you know, as as is what everyone says about Asimov, like mainly there for the ideas. Like I was there for cool t- discussions of robot brains rather than deep characterization or, or incredible detail. Yeah. I, I do think that's it. Like there's some great concepts there. But like with a lot of the stuff that Tolkien did, it's they they said no one's really done this thing, and I think it should look like this. And then over time, other writers have got to pull bits out and stretch them and bend them and play with them and see what you can really do. And it doesn't diminish those original works, but it does make it harder, I think, sometimes to go back to them. It does, yeah. and I and I don't think every you know i don't think things are by definition better because they're more recent i think you know you, you somebody today can write a terrible version of an asimov story just as much as they could in the 1950s and 60s but i think that every thing that's that is written today is building on this legacy of both those original ideas or you know you know the the, the original concepts and then the subsequent iterations of those concepts over the years and everyone is always building on the last generation's worth of work um and i i like to sample from the whole of that not just say well you know i think i think i think i saw a quote once that said the golden age of science fiction is 12 um and i think that was pretty accurate you know because for yeah. me the stuff i was reading when i was 12 was the the kind of new wave british new wave and bit of uh bit of gibson bit of sterling bit of Ursula Le Guin. Um, so I was, that that was my golden age. And I think that's very true. There's just a lot of folk in the fandom scene who the stuff they read when they were 12 is, is, is as I'm often saying. Yeah. Yeah. Right. We've, we've mentioned Ben's maps of Middle Earth and uh, around me, I can unashamedly say are some Tau Empire space battle suits from Warhammer. But do you have writing props around you when you're writing? Uh, relatively few. I um, I mostly write in my office. Uh, I, I work from home as well, so I have a kind of um, home office, uh, which is uh, full of books, absolutely tons of books. Um, just turning around to look at my bookshelves, actually. Um, and there's a few sort of things that I've collected from various travels and things like that, and lots of birthday cards that I should probably bin. Um, I think the... Uh, the, the the one big thing is kind of uh, art, so science fiction art and sort of fantasy art as well. Um, I, I kind of, I, I, I haunt um, <clears throat> art station quite a lot and play sites like that where where people post their, their portfolio work. Um, yeah. And my younger brother works in games development, so he, he kind of got me into that and he sends me uh, cool concept art for various games and TV shows and um, people's personal projects and things, and so yeah. I quite often have like a slideshow of art station stuff going on, you know, a second screen. Um, and I think the probably the only actual prop would be um, a stone, I mean, an etched stone that my wife had made for me after my first story was picked up by Clark's World, um, and that story is called Vegvisir. And Vegvisir is a an Icelandic rune, um, or a Norse rune, uh, that is the navigation rune. Um, and it's a beautiful design. It's a kind of star with various fiddly bits on the ends. And it's, it's a beautiful piece of, uh, of art. And she had that etched on a, on, a, on a circular stone for me. And that sits on top of my monitor um, as a, just a little reminder of like the first story that I had published and, and a little thing to look at. It's wonderful. Sounds lovely. I, I'm intrigued by this idea of having a slideshow on your second monitor whilst you're writing. That's something that I've that's not occurred to me before. Do you find that you're that you don't get bothered by your eyes sort of uh, having their focus drawn away from what you're writing? No, no, not particularly. It's because I when I'm writing. Uh, any given minute of that I'm writing, I'm probably typing for half of it and sort of staring into the middle distance for the other 30 seconds. And uh, mm. it's quite nice to have something just to look at. And that, those, uh, that slideshow of images is sometimes just sort of uh, just a big library of stuff that I've kind of added to my little list of liked stuff on, on ArtStation over the years, or it's thematically appropriate. So when I'm writing in a particular 
setting or a particular context, I might have images just floating by. And I, it, just, it just helps. I write very early in the morning, so the the room is quite often quite dark, and it's just quite nice to have something sliding sliding away in the, in the corner there so I can stare at something other than the wall when I need to. I like that. That, that sort of there's something quite um not uh, cozy is not the correct word but um comforting potentially this idea you know all these interesting bits of creativity that people have done you sort of surrounding yourself with with it and uh, on like a rotating display i like it a lot i i write with a my my wallpaper on my second monitor is black um right. because i i can't if i have something ticking away on the other monitor when i'm writing i can't uh, my focus just gets pulled um which is at odds with how normally I, I normally have like something going on my phone and something on both monitors and normally talking to someone but writing to me is like it's so it's such like a laser focus bit that i don't think i could manage that but um honestly i, I once went and tried to give him a little kissy on the forehead and he beat the shit out of me so i, I actually <laughs> do get really touchy about it, people interrupting me whilst i'm writing <laughs> It's it it is actually a problem, like because it, it's it's a bit like it's sort of golem like. I sort of spin around in my chair, hunched over, face contorted <laughs> in rage. Yeah, there's a, there's a reason I write very early in the morning, and it's the 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 lack of interruptions is a, is a big one. Definitely. Yeah, definitely. Oh, fantastic. So, so uh... yeah, go go ahead, Nico. You. No, no, after you, please. Um, well, I was going to ask. What gives you satisfaction whilst you're writing? Um, well, I think um, I think one of the things I always tend to say because I don't think it's said often enough is that at least some portion of writing should give you satisfaction. I think there are um, I, I I I do come across folk quite often who seem to have convinced themselves that writing is the thing that will make them happy and or famous and or wealthy um yeah. but they hate doing it and i'm always like yo there are way better ways to make money or to get famous than <laughs> than writing you know so like maybe try try one of those um but i think I think if you don't have some sort of intrinsic satisfaction or enjoyment in some part of the process, then maybe consider a different art form because, or, or just not doing something creative, you know, go, go um, figure something else out. But I would totally agree. I totally yeah. Agree. Yeah. I'm making and you I, right. Cause I, I think, I think there's a tendency to buy into the sort of, Oh, you know, we have to be tortured in order to do this and, you know, look at us we're we're writers. Uh, yeah. let's be tortured together and i'm like mm, no if it's to if it's torturous you're possibly doing it wrong um or you're writing the wrong thing or you are buying into a kind of cultural mythos which is largely bullshit um but i i think for me the the thing that i take the most satisfaction from is probably editing um and and i think that's probably because that was my biggest scariest thing for many years that I just didn't really know how to do um and I've written I've written about this several times on my on my website but I think that I used to sort of I think I, I think I, I described myself once in a blog post as like an anxious draft producing shark mm -hmm. and that I was just constantly moving forward and I couldn't stop so I just kept sort of chucking these mounds of words out behind me that weren't they weren't finished books but they were you know book like piles of words mm. and i just never went back to them I, you know i would finish the draft and i would chuck it over my shoulder and then i'd crack on with the next one and i think the what changed is about four or five years ago i said right i need to learn how to produce publishable books not just book-sized piles of words um and i looked across all the sort of compost heaps of, of, of letters that I had and went, which of these might be worth editing? And I picked one and started editing it and basically went through all these different sort of methods for editing. I, I kind of one pass revision and I went through different, you know, print it all out or retype the whole novel. I tried all these different methods of, of editing a book and eventually I settled on the, the process I have now. But in doing so, I basically learned to really enjoy that part of the process because that's when you take all the little gleaming, really good bits that 
you know you do produce in a first draft every first draft i think has a few really nice things in it and i took all those little gleaming bits and i tried to make the whole of the manuscript uh, if not that good then at least better than it was and it went through yeah. and kind of polished it up and polished it up and polished it up and the more i did that the mo- the kind of better and faster at it uh, i got and then also the the kind of more i started to enjoy it and now it's like possibly the my favorite part of the process because it's the it's the part of the process where i can actually see the book getting better mm. day by day so you you mentioned them briefly before but it sounds like you have a little community around you that you do some of this process with too yeah uh, i i i'm possibly over committed and <laughs> writing community terms i used to be uh very much just on my own um uh, and I, I did have a very demanding day job a few days a few years ago which made it quite difficult to kind of reliably meet people and do things like that um and i started a critique group in edinburgh in about 2014 so god nearly a decade ago now um that i no longer run but it's still it's still going um and then i around 2019 the chimera festival that i was talking about in the the last episode um which is edinburgh's science fiction fantasy and horror festival that got going in 2019 and there was a group of people at that festival who met up and said you know we're all science fiction and fantasy and horror fans we all write we're all interested in this industry and interested in writing you know books and short stories should we start a group and they started this group edinburgh sff which I joined in 2020, I want to say, or maybe late, maybe early 2021. Um, and through that group, I met a guy, uh, Nicholas Binge. He's a, another author. He's, his debut comes out in April, actually. And, oh, he, and I learned that he was in this very, very intensive critique group. Um, and I basically bullied him into letting me join the group um because it you know he was kind of like it's really intense man it's super intense because i think a lot of people are in writing groups where you know you meet once a fortnight or once a month and you read one person's story and it's two or three thousand words and it's you know it's not a huge amount of reading um and that's very very common because that's how much time people have and he's like no we read like 15 20 000 words a week we ought you know everyone posts everyone reads uh we you know we do ton everyone reads each other's work comments on it on google docs and it's this quite intensive process and i was like sign me up man that sounds amazing and uh yeah i, I kind of wheedled my way in by giving him advice on on the guns in his in his stories because I, I was briefly in the territorial army so i can kind of go no that you know you you couldn't shoot somebody with that kind of gun they would they would explode into pink mist and and he was like all right okay uh you seem to know your stuff can you fact check this for me? And, you know, we just started, started chatting that way. And then uh, eventually I managed to wheedle my way into this group. And it's fantastic. It's pro- probably the the most transformative uh, writing experience I've ever had in my life. Because it's a group of, there's about five or six of us. In fact, I think there's seven, I think there's seven now. I can't do the, can't do the maths. But um, okay. we, yeah, we meet up pretty much every week. We read each other's work. I, you know, I'm feeding my current book through that. Uh, through that group uh, a chapter at a time uh, and then we uh, meet, up, meet up on the Sunday and we talk about the the chapters and, and I think the thing that makes it very efficient is that most of the actual critiquing goes on in Google Docs so people are leaving comments and you've got that record of what everyone thinks of your story and then the the meeting on the Sunday is is for discussion so it's, it's like yeah. asking follow-up questions and that kind of thing and it's an incredibly useful and also just um affirmative process and, and it just it just really makes you feel part of a very strong community of writers so the the meetup on the sunday i'm, I'm absolutely fascinated about this because the whole process sounds great and I, I'm, I'm loving the fact that you're a part of it as well um you said it was a fairly intense group the actual feedback process and then the follow-up on the sunday do you find that people get very blunt with you or is it um, obviously everything is likely to be constructive because it sounds like it's a very positive, as you say, a positive group, but is there almost like a, like a mantra to, to always be honest about people's work, like not try and swaddle anything just. Oh yeah. Yeah. I think so. I think um, 
I think people go through stages with writing groups. Some people, you know, you, you, you start out and you're just like, oh, really what you want is like affirmation. You want, you, you want people to read your stuff and say, yeah, this is good. Keep writing, you know, and, and there's a point, I think, at which people essentially just want a bit of a hug. They just want to be, you know, <laughs> welcomed into the writing community and just, and just confirmed. Yes, you're, you're, this is a good use of your time. You know, you, instead of playing Grand Theft Auto or whatever, this is, this is an excellent, excellent way to spend your, your evenings or your mornings. And I think I've been in those groups. I've, I've, I've led one of those groups for a while. Um, and then, and then you kind of get, you, you develop beyond that and you get into groups where people are, are quite, um, are, are, are being more direct or a bit more detailed but i think a lot of groups are quite um shall we say highly variable in the in the usefulness of the critique and and mm -hmm. also just some people aren't, aren't that great at giving critique and they can sometimes unintentionally uh insult people or make them angry or you know give them just feedback that just doesn't doesn't misses the point of the story that's another thing that yeah. happens quite a lot and i think what we have is a, it's an invite only group so everyone in that group is is kind of we we know coming in that everyone in that group is uh is working at a certain level and it, that the the danger to that obviously is that you get into a little comfortable group where you're all sort of patting each other's backs and it's not actually that um useful as a critique group but i think we have gradually cycled through new members we're we're kind of we're not recruiting but we do we do bring pe new people in. I think our most recent member started about two or three months ago. And that keeps um, you on a sort of thing. Yeah, it does. It does. Yeah. And the dynamics, I think the dynamic in the group changes subtly with each new member as they come in because they bring something slightly different. You know, I came in and was just, you know, bringing my nerdy technical knowledge and, and uh, fact checking. Uh, and, and, you know, because Nick, Nick's, uh writes a lot of stuff that is kind of set in specific time periods. And, you know, I I start many comments on his drafts with this doesn't work the way you think it does, uh, and, <laughs> you know, and he, here's some links. <laughs> and, and uh, you know, he does the same for me when, when we're talking about kind of character motivation and um, or where I've been a little bit lazy with the dialogue or, you know, because he's really great at that. So we, we kind of fill in for each other's weaknesses um, in really useful and interesting ways. And every time a new person joins, we, we kind of gain a a fresh skill set and a fresh set of eyes and and that that really is is it's an amazing group it's probably it's i i it wouldn't be too far to say it's changed changed my life for the better fantastic what a glowing amazing. glowing endorsement of uh sort of group critiquing and and workshopping and writers yeah group. when it when it works it works amazingly it's it's extremely hard to find a group where everyone has the same about the same level of ability about the same level of critiquing skill uh about the same level of commitment and about the same level of ability to uh to just to get through the words um and mm -hmm. to, to draft um and and a, a lot of the sort of flexing we've had to do is working out ways to make it easy for people to pick stuff up again if they miss a couple of weeks and um, so there's lots of little process changes that we've made to to make that easier but yeah it's it, it's incredibly hard to find, but what I I would say if you if you find the group like that, like cling on to it with both hands. What would you say is the top critiquing skill? What is the best critiquing skill? Um, I think the biggest one for me is knowing when people stumble in a story, because you know a, a story or a chapter of a book or or any sort of narrative is a is a is a is a tightrope walk because you're you're walking along suspended and you're suspending your disbelief you're you're walking along that tightrope and anything that makes you stumble and potentially fall off is the point where the reader would put the book down or get distracted or pull their phone out of their pocket you know there's a million and one ways to spend your time your yeah. leisure time in in the 21st century and uh I think the best, the thing that I get the most out of is where I think I'm doing that tightrope walk beautifully, and one of my critique partners says, I had to read this sentence three times, it doesn't make any sense. <laughs> and I'm like, you know, and it's that, uh, our critique is at that level where we're all quite comfortable with each other and quite comfortable with being quite blunt about about these things. And, you know, yeah. if you, I, 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 and I think you also quite like to see the reaction if you've, if you've you know, pulled off a plot twist or you've or you've managed to 
bring somebody in or or you've written a particularly lyrical passage or something that people are really excited to to read or or, or excite you know they're, they're following the story along and they're excited to get to a certain point that's very validating obviously mm. but equally when you've yeah. uh, when you've screwed it up and you've re- revealed something too early or you've done something really obvious or you've uh, overused some sort of trope or or you've just repeated a word five times in the same paragraph and you've knocked them out of the story it's it's equally useful to get that little prod and say no you, you've not you've not pulled this off mate and we do that all the time you know i just last week i was reading somebody's chapter and i was like i can see what you were trying to do here it doesn't work and then they did almost exactly the same i don't think it was retribution but they, they basically <laughs> looked at, at my piece and said this i can see what you're trying to do here but it doesn't quite land that sounds and, like it was a teaching moment it sounds like yeah. you taught them how to interact with it like that or at least reminded them of how to interact like that yeah and we do have we do have language that we have kind of evolved like if if, uh, if you have these sort of echoes in a chapter uh, where um, or in a in a in a paragraph where you use the word you know illumination twice in a yeah. in a in a in a paragraph something that sticks out because it it's a memorable word we'll just put you know one x two x three x if we see the same word multiple times or we'll put you know we'll just put a little note said I'm reading happily here this is great and then a paragraph later this took me out you know and we just have these little phrases that we all use uh, that we've developed over the over the years. Hmm. That was a that was a fascinating insight. This next question is going to be a total step change. Um, oh, yeah. Do you, do you listen to music whilst you're writing? Um, I do, but I think I don't have a I don't have a cool answer for this. <laughs> like, okay. um, I, I most of the time it's like a it's like a YouTube channel. It's like lo-fi beats to study, relax mm-hmm. to, or yeah, yeah. it is uh, Apple Music chill. Or if I'm writing uh, SF, I've sometimes got some sort of um, sf film music on or um fantasy mu- uh, fantasy soundtrack um i've discovered there's a whole genre of sort of uh mid-budget hollywood um military thrillers things like um, mile 22 and um the gray man they all have they have these very fast move fast moving drum heavy uh, soundtracks which are brilliant for writing action sequences too <laughs> because they're just like there's no words there's no um you know they're, they're just da, 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 you know they just get that get you going uh so I'll, I'll i'll my my apple music like replay last year was like 50 percent uh mid mid budget action flick soundtracks and it must I don't, I don't know what this the servers at apple headquarters think i am but they they're <laughs> kind of like here's some more middling action movie soundtracks for you uh, I, have one, yeah. I have one for you uh the man from uncle that's good i i, I still listen oh, to the, the, the remake movie. yes right good good i'll add that to my list mm. and and this is oh this is incredibly um uh rc but the, the when i'm editing i quite often put like a, a a jazz playlist on just because it is not too uh it's not too uh, repetitive or, or beat heavy uh and it just seems to for some reason that seems to go with my editing mindset it just kind of helps me to focus i don't know why so the uh the the muso in me has to come out now when we say jazz are we talking like sort of stripped down new york jazz are we talking about wild like New Orleans blues, that kind of French. Where 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 do we sit? What what is editing jazz? I think it is quite. Uh, it's the very uh, trumpet heavy, very um, simple. Um, do you know Do you know the soundtrack to Motherless Brooklyn? No, it has some has some amazing jazz on it. Um, it's that kind of it's New York club jazz essentially. I would say. Yeah. Yeah. Um, and and that is where my jazz knowledge ends. So please don't ask me to elaborate. Um, but you know, bit of Miles Davis, bit of John Coltrane, which is probably not New York jazz. I've probably screwed that up. But um, I, I know almost nothing apart from one or two um, musician I, names. I like that because it's, it's like you, even though it's it's outside your creative sphere, you can still like cherry pick what you need to help you in yours. I like, it. Yeah. I like the interplay between that. Definitely, I will. Mm. Uh... As, as an aside in this conversation, Ben, I finally found a type of music I cannot write while listening to. Really? What was it? So we did, you know, I, I've written to Christmas songs. I've written to heavy metal. Yeah, it's insane. Go- I, I, I don't Gregorian understand. chanting, I can't write to it. Oh, that's Ironic, weird. considering today, uh, the stories from the last episode. Well, that's, uh, that's, 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 what I, I, yeah. that's what I put it on for. 
Yeah. And uh, lo- long story short, I also forgot I'd been listening to it. Uh, and then when I left work at the end of that day, I uh, pulled the USB out that connects my headset. And I hadn't had my headphones on for a few hours because I'd been writing during my lunch break. And Gregorian chanting exploded through the IT office. So that was fun. <laughs> But yeah, I just couldn't. It put the fear in me. I couldn't do it. I, I just was like panicked. So this is this is a reversal of our of our states because today I listened to Gregorian chants whilst I was editing this story, and really enjoyed it. So maybe maybe it would have You're been more freak. difficult whilst I was writing. I don't know, but normally normally I I try and keep I do like silence and then like a track to sort of get the vibe going, yeah. and then I go back to silence. But uh, yeah, that's that's fun. I'm gonna I'm gonna you know I'm gonna assault you with Gregorian chant music now. That's gonna hairy g- Gregorian chanting. <laughs> <laughs> right, Dave. No surrender, no retreat. What's your favorite novel? I am. Th- this is another one of those that changes all the time, and I think I probably have my my current favorite, as in the thing I most enjoyed most recently um and and the kind of uh, the touchstone ones that that don't really change um and i'm trying to think about my current oh, it's tough because i one of the downsides to having a really strong writing community is that you spend a lot of time beta reading other people's books um which is uh awesome because you get to read books early on in the process and and you get to kind of observe books as they get better when they're being they're being rewritten mm. um but it, it also means that your your reading of actual published fiction goes down the swanee pretty much yeah. um and i, I try to think i think probably the favorite book i've read this year is not a published book but it's uh, it's a book by my uh, writing friends uh erin and morag who write as mk hardy and they have written a novel called the need fire um which is gothic kind of uh, sapphic uh thriller well, that's not really a thriller it's like a suspense novel and it's set in the very far north of scotland and it was you know put it this way that that is not a combination i would have sought out in a bookshop uh yeah. but we've become very good friends over discord and uh i volunteered to to beta read it as they were uh writing the second half of it and it was just fantastic so i really enjoyed that but that's that's a bit of a cheat answer because nobody can actually buy that yet <laughs> um so i think probably my long-term answer is um accession by ian m banks who is probably both the the writing career model that i'd love to follow um and i think the uh, uh very much just an absolute leading light of both science fiction and and Scottish writing as well, and uh, Accession I think is my favourite of his culture novels because it has it, it has so many things in it that I think at the time were completely groundbreaking and even now are are very still still really fresh and it just reads uh, it's 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 a really incredible read. It's got this very unique form where there's these giant AI ship minds all talking to each other via sort of um, light speed communication and it's all presented almost like a like a like a group whatsapp um but in space uh with with all these sort of different groups talking to each other and and uh, intrigues going on in the background and it, it it's a very interesting examination of how the culture which is this you know utopian uh, ai run society how it deals with a potentially mortal threat and it's just a fantastic book it's just it's so so re-readable and readable um and i've got it in about three different formats i've got it in paperback and audiobook and i, th- I think i have a hardback somewhere as well and i just yeah i probably reread it once every couple of years i believe that's the third vote for specifically that book it's an amazing book i think if you're a if you're a scottish SF inclined person in your thirties or early forties, it's probably you've probably read it, and it's probably one of the best, better books you've read. Uh, so it does tend to, or you probably read it at the age where it's going to stick in your mind. It, that was actually going to be my follow-up question because we we have heard, uh, as as Nick says, that uh, at least you know Ian M. Banks and and also that novel uh, mentioned before on the podcast. Do you feel like writing is a part, like storytelling, is a, is a part of your identity uh, as you know, as a Scotsman? Oh, hundred percent. Yeah, I mean, 
the the largest monument to a writer in the world is in is in Edinburgh. Um, it's the 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 Scott Monument. Um, and it's the I think it's the largest monument built by public subscription as well. You know, the guy wrote books so good that people built a literal Gothic rocket ship sculpture <laughs> to him right in the middle of the city. And you know, Edinburgh has the uh, the Writers Museum, which is just all about all the various writers who are from Edinburgh, and and it's not just Edinburgh. Obviously, there's, there's writers from loads of other places in Scotland, particularly sure. Glasgow and. Uh, up north as well and i think that um yeah you you just get there's a, i think there's a respect for the written word in the scottish cultural conversation um that has always been there and you know we've robert burns etc but we it's very much part of the education system here and very much part of the the constant conversation of what it means yeah. to be Scottish is it, we, we're always talking about how we represent ourselves, what our past means, um, you know, what things will look like in the future with our science fiction, and we're, um, you know, and then there's the Irvin Welshies and the Ian Rankins um, talking about contemporary Scotland, mm. and you know, it's it's yeah, books are a big part of how I think we think about and talk about ourselves. I think that's yeah. uh, entirely commendable for for a people. To do that, I think that's fantastic. I wouldn't say, as a, as an Englishman, that that really happens very much um, for me, or, I mean, or didn't happen I'm when I was from a kid. Essex. We write a telly program, and it's horrible. Yeah, <laughs> but like beyond something like Shakespeare, someone like Shakespeare, like, and that's so distant that it's impossible to really glom onto it and and take it as any kind of model for for a career path. Um, yeah, I think I, I don't think there's any celebration of English authors by English people. I, I think I, I think there are a lot more of you than there are of us. You know, there's fifty odd million English folk, um, and I think it, it's a bit much. It's, it's we're about the same size. Like Scotland and England are roughly equivalent in landmass, I believe. But there's more people inside the M25 than there is in the whole of Scotland. Mm. Um, so it's it, it's a know. much smaller country in a, in a lot of ways, and as a result, I think that that kind of cultural conversation. Is probably a little easier to have, but just because the you know the the favourite book of someone from Yorkshire uh, is potentially quite different to the favourite book of somebody from Surrey, um, yeah. and I think whereas the Scotland's because we're we're a bit smaller culturally speaking, um, and there's fewer of us, and it rains a lot, and we spend a lot of time indoors. Mm-hmm. Um, I think there's just I think there's maybe just a predisposition to to think about ourselves in words. I love it. I think I think it's fantastic. So, thank you for uh, exemplifying it. This is all right. too too lovely. I'm go- let's make it miserable. You're gonna break what it down. is the least enjoyable trope of fiction for you? And you can't say written by an Englishman. <laughs> no, I wouldn't dream of it. I, I lived I lived down south for six years. I've got a very fond place in my heart for fantastic. the land of the Angles. Um, <laughs> so, probably the. I think the 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 thing that annoys me most in fiction is 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 uh, baddies who are not ruthlessly efficient. So it's it's uh, um, somebody who insists on you know the kind of classic Bond. I'm going to explain what I'm doing to you because um, I think the few pieces of fiction that have bad guys who are genuinely terrifyingly ruthless where they don't waste any time they don't explain the plot to the protagonist they just shoot people or you know chuck them out of an airlock or whatever those kind of uh morally bankrupt sociopathic villains i think are far 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 more effective um obviously it depends on the story that you're telling uh and and if you if you need to have the monologuing baddie in order to allow time for the the hero to to do something clever then you know you're going to have a monologuing baddie but i think there's probably better ways to uh make that time than than to fall back on the uh i expect you to die mr bond tropes uh, i just yeah. i find them annoying whenever I, and as soon as i run into it i'm like just shoot him just shoot it. he's right in front of you what are you doing? Uh, so yeah, uh, that, that's definitely the kind of thing that takes me out every single time. And if if I was if 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 a story like that came through my critique group, I'd be like, nope, sorry, I this is uh, stopping me from reading. It's taking me out of the story. That's understandable. That's understandable. I mean, where would you land on something like Game of Thrones, where the characters are all morally grey, and yes, there are sort of, but there's no really identifiable. That one's definitely the baddie. Like. 
as at yeah. least attempts to reconcile most characters. Yeah, I, I well, I mean, the Game of Th- uh, Song of Ice and Fire is, is has has lots of lots of issues, but I think the one problem it doesn't have is baddies who do silly things. They do mm. foolish things because they have imperfect information, or they're jealous, or they're angry. Um, but I think that kind of fantasy story has people who are ruthless in a in a believable way um you know tywin lannister is not going around explaining to i mean he does he does explain to Arya stark at one point but that's because he doesn't realize she's Arya stark um but i think you know tywin lannister's not rolling around kind of monologuing at ned stark before he has his head chopped off i think that was his son actually i can't remember Uh, but i think you know they are doing what they're doing in a believable way because they are humans trying to dominate or control or take mm. over, and 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 I think that's always you know I think that's always going to win out for me as characters who are acting like real humans rather than just movers of the plot. Yeah, I like it. I like it. There is there is one character that isn't like that in Game of Thrones. I think it's uh, the character Gregor Clegane, the mountain that rides. Right. He is just. He's just a, not a nice person. There's, you know, he he mutilates his brother when he's a child. He's, uh, he's a rapist. He's a murderer. He, he, as soon as he's let off the leash, he will do what you were describing that that ruthless efficiency, the application of evil. Yeah, um, absolutely. He's he's a deeply damaged uh, and unfortunate man in many ways, and I think um, I think it's. Uh, yeah, you know, he's. I, I think he's a fairly convincing portrayal of a of a very damaged um, oh, person who's seen a lot of terrible stuff. So not Sander Clegane, his older brother, Gregor Clegane. The, uh... Oh no, he's just dreadful. Yeah, yes, absolutely. exactly. No. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. Sorry, I got my Clegane's mixed up. Embarrassing. Yeah. <laughs> Goodness me. Well, well, um, the editing process you spoke about before. We we we've started asking this question to everyone, and it's interesting when we get different answers. Um, but how do you know when you're finished? When are you done editing? Now that you've now that you've taught yourself how to edit and you've learned to enjoy the process, now you enjoy it the most. When do you know when to stop? Um, so it's a it's a it's a mixture of kind of mechanistic process following and also just kind of gut feel. Um, I think that I do multiple passes on everything I do um, on short stories. You know, I will, I'll draft it. I'll read it a day or two later. Um, I'll try and edit it. And when I'm writing longer fiction, when I'm writing novels, um, my Fridays are my kind of editing day. Um, and I, 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 cause you can edit about four days worth of output in one day. So if I, I work Monday to Friday on my writing and so I write for four days and then edit for one and, uh, that mechanistic process gets me a pretty reasonable second or third draft. And then I run that through the critique group. They'll have a look at it. They'll give me comments. I take all those comments and I action them. It's, it's, so it's all very kind of business processy. Um, and then uh, once I've done that, I'll post a new version. And, you know, if there's any follow up comments, I might incorporate them as well. And then once I've got a kind of integrated whole book, uh, I stick it on. Uh, my e-reader and I read it as though it were an actual book Um, and I've got a sort of system where I as I'm reading if I spot a typo or if I spot something that is a continuity error or something that is confusing I'll just leave a little uh, note I use the kind of annotation feature Um, and because the 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 little e-ink keyboard on my e-reader is terrible I'll just um, type like a, a code so um i'll put like c c o n t say that carefully um like continuity <laughs> or um you know a uh, typo or whatever i'll just put a little code in and then i can export that as a text file and that's like a ready made to do list and because those that's annotations great. are yeah it's, it's it's really useful and when i worked out i could do that i was like oh this is going to save me so much paper and time <laughs> um, and the, the 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 best part about it is because with annotations in an e-reader, you're you're attaching the annotation to a chunk of text, and because I write in Scrivener, which has this really powerful search feature, I can just type in that phrase and instantly find. So I don't need to keep track of page numbers or 
put anything in a spreadsheet. It just all happens in that I use Scrivener as well. I, I find that to be a an excellent bit of software. I, I, we don't we are, we are not uh, uh, supported by them in any way, but I would recommend it to anyone that's. Uh, anyone oh yeah, hundred percent. I I live in Scrivener. I I use it pretty much every day. Yep, definitely. Um, Do you uh, do you put any effort into making sure those little uh, those little annotations are funny? Like you could have proof proofreading indicates complication, so you just write prick a lot of times. <laughs> I I haven't consciously made any funny acronyms, but now that you've suggested that, I might. Um, but once once I've <clears throat> once I've done that that pass, I'll, I'll I'll read it again. I'll you know go. Th- I I probably I think one of the things about the editing process is basically making peace with the fact you're probably going to re- be reading your book three or four times at least possibly yeah. seven or eight times and then i get to a point where i've read it i've annotated it i've made all the changes i can think of i've read it again i've annotated it again and i've run out of things that i can reasonably think of to fix and then i send it to my agent or i send it to a beta reader if it's uh, if, if it's at that stage and basically repeat the process but with their notes instead of my own notes um and Basically, I know it's done when we've both run out of things to say or think about it, and we're both sick of the sight of it. Um, yeah. And at that point, you have to get it off your desk because you've you've basically fallen out of love with it at that point. You're at the point where if you keep writing and keep working on it, you're probably going to make it worse rather than better. Mm. That's a good. That's a good note. I like that. This idea that yeah, no, that's very well put. Thank you. I found that one useful myself. I, I found myself listening as an audience member then for a moment. That was very good. Um, Lovely. Now, this is Nico's favourite question. Best question time. It's best question time. Best question. So, unlimited budget. We're hiring you to adapt any book into another medium of your choice. What book are you going to pick? What medium are you going to put it into? And why? <clears throat> so... I I thought about this for a while and I'm like in a perfect universe where I can absolutely guarantee the creative outcome it would probably be Ian M. Banks's The Culture Novels as multiple season length uh, HBO specials um, but I think I've realised that you know it's, Ian M. Banks's fiction has such a kind of idiosyncratic voice um, and I, so much of it is bound bound up in that voice that I think it would probably be really difficult to adapt. So I think my, on consideration, my actual answer is a different series of novels, which is the Patrick O'Brien Aubrey Matron novels, um, which I've got, I've got, uh, I've got. There's twenty of them. Uh, I've got a yard of them behind me on the shelf, and th- the film Master and Commander is based on notionally on the first one of those books but also has a chunk from the 10th i think the far side of the world um so it's basically two books kind of joined together as well as scenes and and bits of dialogue from from right across the whole season the whole series but i think that is probably a candidate for a perfect historical drama that could run for 10 seasons or 20 seasons and have you know a slowly changing cast and I think it would be fantastic because they are wonderful books and they're so well done and they use this really fascinating omniscient point of view, which I think is very much out of favour now that sort of swoops in and around the ship and then around the houses when they're on they're on land um, and just you, follows the characters and he does all sorts of amazing things with, with voice and with uh, reported speech and... and um, yeah, he's he's a fantastic writer, and I think that that would translate very effectively onto the screen. And there's obviously lots of exciting things, uh, escapes from French prisons, and and uh, lots of battles, obviously on sea, and domestic drama, and uh, high intrigue, and uh, treachery, and espionage, and just so many different things. And I am frankly astonished that uh, the we didn't get a series of films after the 2003 film. Uh, but you, I think it would a, be. A... Were you a fan of the 2003 film? Yeah, I was. I think, uh, I think some of the purists are like, well, you know, uh, that's not my Jack Aubrey, that's not my Stephen Matron in my head. 
But I think they both did pretty good jobs. I think Paul Bettany did a pretty good job as Matcher yeah, as well. That was my follow up question. Would you would you keep Russell Crowe and Paul Bettany or would you I think they're both too unfortunately I think they're both a bit too old to do it now because in, at the start of the novels, uh Aubrey and Matron are sort of in their mid to late twenties. Um, so I, I don't think if they were to go back to the start and do the whole thing again, I don't think they could cast so Russell Crowe. Like, oh. like a Logan situation, cast old no. man Aubrey. Yeah, I mean, I, I know they can do a lot with de-aging software these days, but um, I think, uh, yeah, I think it would benefit from some new faces. And uh, yeah, it's, it's, I just think they would be fantastic um, and, 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 a, and a really, uh, and they would bring more readers to the books, I think, which is, which would be a good thing because they're fantastic books. They, they are, in some ways, they're products of their time. They're, you know, written in the 60s, 70s and 80s. Um, but uh, they're also, I think, quite pretty, pretty good just amazing books that are worth reading i've uh it's it, really cool excellent description I've, I've also heard them um referred to as like the thinking man shop is that yes is that yeah i think so yeah they have some of the same sort of guts and glory um vibes uh and it's uh, following a kind of central character through through time and through various very large historical events and i think there's a lot of overlap there um they are very um sparkly and witty in, in very interesting ways. I don't think the sharp books necessarily are. Um, and there's a hell of a lot of, you know, if you speak Latin, there's lots of jokes in there for you because uh, <laughs> Stephen Matron is a, a physician who ma- likes to make lots of little bon mots in, in Latin. And uh, yeah, the, there's just, there's, there's something for everyone. There's there's ships exploding, there's uh, French spies, there's just daring do, it's great. Fantastic. Uh, but Bernie C is a regular listener, so Big Burn, we know you're listening. We're, we're not hating on the sharp stuff. Don't worry about it. <laughs> no, I mean, those we, are great books. They're just, yeah. It's for thickos. It's fine. Don't worry, Burn. <laughs> <laughs> hey, I love those books. Uh, too complicated for me. <laughs> <laughs> oh, no, it's been fantastic. Um, so we've we've spoken a lot about your processes and we've, we heard, of course, your story, which was excellent in the previous episode. But where should people start reading you? Um, so I've got two short stories. Obviously, there's a short story from the last episode, which you should listen yeah. to if you haven't already. Um, there are two published short stories out there. There's uh, Veg Vasir, which is in the July, nope, sorry, December 2021 episode of Clark, uh, episode, issue of Clark's World. Um, and there is Carapace, which is in the July 2022 issue. Um, you can find both of them on the Clark's World website, but they're also linked from my website as well. And uh, Veg Vasir is a spooky Martian short story um about somebody lost in a dust storm and carapace Mm -hmm. is a kind of indeterminate future period where there's a war largely being fought by robot giant robot battle suits basically uh and one Mm -hmm. of them gains consciousness at an inopportune moment uh, God, that a... sounds like i would hate it and not be <laughs> even remotely interested <laughs> Rather, he, would, he would uh, he would devour it and never stop talking about it i think is what he actually means there <laughs> um, fantastic and um and again where can people find you online where, where should they read about what you've got coming out and all that kind of thing yeah, uh, probably the easiest way to find me is davidgoodman.net. That's my website. Um, and uh, you can you can Google David Goodman writer, but you may end up on David Goodman, the guy that writes for South Park and is quite high up in the Writers Guild of America. Um, uh, that's not me, obviously. I'm in, I'm in Edinburgh. Um, but uh, davidgoodman.net is my website. Uh, Words by Goodman on Twitter is my Twitter handle. And Dave Goodman on mastodon is my handle on the wandering shop instance fantastic well you heard the man go and follow him read his words read his stories and we'll be uh, definitely watching for what you've got coming out next and stuff but thank you again for your time and it was You're very uh, welcome to, it was illuminating to talk to you very illuminating <laughs> thank you very much guys thanks for joining us for this episode of the tiny bookcase remember to subscribe otherwise you're going to miss out on the future fun Also, tell a friend. If you like this episode, link them to it. We'd be tremendously grateful. You can follow us on Twitter at Bookcase Tiny, Facebook at The Tiny Bookcase, and Instagram at Bookcase Tiny for updates. Speaking of supporting the podcast, 
Well, magic can only take one so far. The tiny bookcase is supported by the generosity of its patrons. Those kind souls have really kept my belly full the last year. Let's cast a spell for them, shall we? For uh, magnificent beardery, let's cast the Chinicus Folliculale spell on Gary Laird. For rich ginger tones on their scalp, let us cast the Orangi Hedondo spell for Scott Byrne. And for general fabulousness, why not the Ula La Alge Mother spell on Matthew McLaren? How do you come up with that shit, man?